Hi, I'm Marty Otanias. Welcome to Getting High on Anthropology, episode 26. Uh, today we have a guest, Kevin White. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So, Kevin, why don't you tell us about the organization that you're with and what are some of the um, short-term goals that you have? Okay. So, I am with 420 Philanthropy. Um, we are an organization that believes that um, we can further advance the cause of legalization of cannabis through philanthropy. And I work with an organization called the Doing Good Foundation. Uh, the Doing Good Foundation is a um, 501c3 here in Colorado, and they provide free programs and services to small local charities. So as we have worked with that organization, we have seen that there's a lot of small charities in the community, and they're kind of not understanding what they can or can't do with cannabis industry in relation to donations and things like that. Um, so 420 Philanthropy is stepping in to help unite the two sectors, the cannabis industry and the nonprofit sector. That's excellent. You have two things that normally don't go together Correct. Right, that you're, you're bringing together. So for people who don't know, can you unpack philanthropy for for? people? Sure, so philanthropy is, is pretty broad. Um, it's basically just giving back into your, your communities or giving back to the world in some charitable form, whether it's time, resources, money is the m most classic definition of philanthropy. Um, and when we relate it to the cannabis industry, it can really be anything as well. Could be time, could be money, could be resources, it could be anything. Okay. so. Um, a bit more about the origins of this focus that you have. So what was the moment where you realized that there was this unmet need or a conversation you had where people said, why don't we do something to you know, systematize some kind of approach where cannabis companies can contribute and then it's disseminated through your organization? Sure, yeah, um, when was that aha moment? It was really when we really started to see, I, I started to look at um, cannabis publications because I was really interested in philanthropy. I'm from the nonprofit sector my entire career. And I was really curious about how they were giving because you know, I'd heard all the rumors that they have these warehouses full of cash just stashed with guards and you know, ex-military forces and all that guarding all this cash because it's a cash industry. And so that kind of got me thinking like, how would they donate? Would it be all cash? And then there's certain regulations within banking that banks have to report. Like if I wanted a $20,000 sponsorship for a charity event and I was given that in cash, if I go to deposit that, the bank has to report that to the federal government. Well, if the federal government has, comes back, are they gonna close my nonprofit because I accepted money from the can? So that was kind of the aha moment when I really started to say, hey, this is a opportunity for my organization, for my charity to advance itself, and then saw my wheels began to turn. I'm like, I don't know if I can take it or not. So I started to do a little bit of research and it seemed like the only reporting that was coming, coming out about giving was just within publications within the cannabis industry, High Times and Cannabis and you know, things that people are looking at. Well, at the same time, there was a separate conversation going on in the nonprofit sector and nonprofit sector saying, well, they're not giving us money or, you know, they're, they're not giving any money. You can see there, you know, nobody knows what's going on. And, you know, that was my other aha moment. It's like, we need to track this because we're tracking taxes and we can mm -hmm. see the taxes and 127 million in 2016. And, but nobody's tracking what they're doing for their communities. And this was an opportunity to say, hey, cannabis is not just taxes, it's a part of their community. They're, they are parts of our community and they should be recognized for the good that they're doing in the community, but there's no way to really track it or bring that to light to the general population. Right, so what's interesting is, let's say I'm a member of a nonprofit and I discuss this with my board and we're considering taking money from the cannabis sector that could be used for some social good. Mm -hmm. So what are the what are the pieces of the decision making that are important for a board member to consider? So I think the most important pieces for a nonprofit are to really understand um, understand what you're doing with that money. Um, just like you would any donation or any large donation is figuring out if 
you're accepting money from a certain sponsor or a certain organization, what their expectations are with what you're doing with that money. For the cannabis industry, a lot of them want people to know that they're doing social good. So from a nonprofit sector, you need to realize that if they're giving you money, you're gonna have to most likely acknowledge that you're accepting that money. And if you're unwilling to acknowledge that you're accepting cannabis money, then it's probably not the way to go. The other one is vision and mission. If your organization has a, a very distinct mission and a very distinct vision and accepting cannabis money or liquor money or tobacco money or what <laughs> oil and gas money is contrary to your vision and your mission, then you're not gonna wanna accept that money either. Um, the other thing is um, basic fiduciary responsibility. As a board member, you're responsible for the financial aspect of your nonprofit. We're still not sure where the feds stand on all this. So, you know, 501c3s are a federal status, not a state status. So you could lose your 501c3 status accepting money from the cannabis industry. Hasn't happened yet, but there's a possibility that it could. Um, the other aspect is federal grants or any grant that's connected with federal money. Um, there are aspects of that that you might you may or may, you may not lose your federal funding from these different sources, governmental. Um, obviously the Denver County doesn't care because they, <laughs> they are taking all the money in, um, but there are other governmental agencies or even cities where if you're paying, um, if you're accepting money from them to do projects within your community, if you accept cannabis money and they're anti-cannabis or don't wanna be associated with the cannabis industry, then you might lose that funding as well. So those are just some of the things. You this need is to look out really for. helpful um, <laughs> in, in so many different ways. And when I met you um, or saw you doing your work um, at this event you held for nonprofit groups a couple of weeks ago, um, the intent was to have a conversation and um, talk about you know what nonprofits should consider, but also the larger landscape of, of cannabis philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So I understand you're in the middle of trying to craft some kind of model policy for nonprofits, what would be some of the key bullet points that you think would go into some policy document that nonprofits could use as a guide about taking cannabis uh, money? It's a, it's a hard one. <laughs> there, there are plenty that are out there that are already being used for, um, oh, I can't remember the exact name offhand, but there, there are a bunch of policies that are out there that you can even Google to know um, whether it's basically all around um, accepting donations and it's an acceptance policy. I don't know why the name's escaping me right now, but it's an acceptance policy of money. And that is, you know, whether you accept, it, it can be as broad as whether you accept um, annuities, whether you accept cars, whether you accept, you know, what kind of donations are you willing to accept as an organization? I know I can't accept a car. I don't have the resources to, find where I can make money off of a car for my organization. So I'm not gonna take cars. But it can be as simple as creating a policy around accepting money from a particular industry. And you know, for this particular, for the cannabis industry, again, taking into account vision, mission, taking into account fiduciary responsibilities, taking into, into account donor, um, that's another one, is taking into account your current system of donors. If your current system of donors are anti-cannabis, uh, for example, an older, you have an older constituency, then you might not want to take cannabis money in risk of losing those donors knowing that you're accepting cannabis money. So there's just a ton of different things that you can add into that policy. Well, this is great. And I think it'd be nice to follow up with you in the future to see if some kind of document, oh, yeah, working absolutely. document <laughs> appears. We will, uh, for sure. And then have you found, is there some kind of trend or pattern where certain kinds of nonprofits are reaching out to, to learn about potential funds from the cannabis sector? We're actually seeing it from all over right now. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it, what's interesting to me is more and more nonprofits are popping up asking about accepting cannabis money from everything, from disease to children to um, animals. Everybody is wanting to learn about whether they can accept and how to accept and what they need to do. But what's more interesting to me is the cannabis community seems to be a little bit more focused on um, 
causes that are directed around the plant. Mm. So whether it's uh, hemp research or whether it's research and patient research in general, whether it's epilepsy, whether it's muscular dystrophy, whether it's any of these other ca cancer, things like that, that seems to be where a lot of the money is going. And what that, not that those are bad causes, they're not. Um, but when we look at impact on community, that's kind of the buzz under the, the buzz under everything is that nonprofits that want the money, that will accept the money that are in, you know, everything from environment to animals to children to whatever, they're like, we'll take it, but nobody's giving it to us. They're just giving it to that. True or not true, and I don't believe that that's true. I just believe that the cannabis companies are having a difficult time finding and connecting to the causes that will accept the money. They might call 10 organizations, usually probably large ones that they know about, and they're wanting to give the money. And those have huge boards, and those boards are like, no, we're not going to take that. Mm -hmm. So it's these smaller ones that really want the money, but there's no real database or anything. I mean, as I mentioned to you earlier, we, we added 10,000 charities in the last year and a half to the state of Colorado. Yeah, that's amazing. It's, it's, it's nuts. So if a cannabis company wants to give, there's plenty that would probably take it. But connecting those is the big challenge, and that's what we're hoping to accomplish. Got it. Again, what I'm so jazzed about is this idea of normalizing cannabis, especially along uh, philanthropic lines. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned this term impact. So I know it's early, I think, in the process, but what exists to determine the efficacy of impact from cannabis money that's being um, disseminated in communities? So that's, there's really nothing. Um, and that's the biggest challenge because they're, if they donate, they can't write it off. So there's no federal document that says this company is giving X amount to charitable contributions. Um, because the cannabis camp, the cannabis industry can't write off anything. They, so they're not listing their marketing, they're not listing sponsorships, then they're not listing donations as to anyone mm -hmm. um, because nobody's checking it. So we're not sure how much impact the cannabis community has or the cannabis industry has within their communities. So um, the other aspect to that is they could be doing things in their community and nobody's really recognizing it that they are unless it's a sponsorship. So they're really focused on sponsorships because it gives them some social impact <laughs> that people are seeing this and they're sponsoring like a movie night in Stapleton or they're sponsoring a, a cl street cleanup in and around their grow houses or dispensary locally and having their own staff volunteer to clean it up. Things like that are, are what they're now giving to in order to show their community's corporate social responsibility. And that's the other thing, corporate social responsibility has now penetrated into the cannabis industry. So I think we're gonna see more and more of that. And I th think also as we see big industry come into the cannabis industry, they're already familiar with corporate social responsibility and that's gonna create more um, pressure Gotcha. within the industry. No, this is good. I'm glad you mentioned corporate social responsibility because it's this arena where companies, um, you know, they have a, um, you know, whatever, triple bottom line. They want to um, uh, be of service to the communities. Mm -hmm. So have you found over time in other industries this idea where people look in a skeptical way at CSR because maybe a company's gestures of goodwill contrast sharply with their practices? Like, are you finding people cynical about this in any way or critical? Yes, I, but I think we see that in every industry, oil and gas. I mean, I, I think we see that in every industry. Um, I, I think the millennials have really brought it to shine to say, yeah, you're giving money, but it's not really making an impact. It's contrary to your own cause. You're doing it for s selfish reasons. Um, I think we're always going to have that backlash when people give. Um, you know, we talk about millionaires and things like that using it as a tax haven. Well, if they didn't use it for a tax haven, there'd be a lot of charities that would have no money. So I think there's a, a lot of different conversations that can take place. I do think there can be that negative stereotype, but I think for us as a, as an, for us as a nonprofit sector and for the cannabis industry, there has to be this meeting of the minds in order to 
make it a mutually beneficial relationship. And I think it's fully possible. Excellent. So one of the things that's interesting about this kind of work, cannabis generally, have you found within your profession or at home when you're at the dinner table with extended family, have people stereotyped you or stigmatized you? Because now, yeah. <laughs> so tell me about like one time, like what was said and how'd you deal with it? I, I mentioned it to my mother. She's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going into the cannabis industry. And she's like, great. I have a user in the family. I can't believe this. My, you know, my aunt uses who's 70 years old and you know, whatever. And I'm like, I'm not a user. I'm just connecting my passion, which is the nonprofit sector with a new resource. And the cannabis industry is a new resource for multiple. It's not just about the money. It's about time. It's about resources. I mean, urban gardens can't function without fertilizer. Well, neither can the cannabis industry. So by connecting different resources or allotting different resources to the local communities, the, not, the cannabis industry can make a huge impact. And you think you convinced your mom? I did, yeah, I think so. She's still a little wary, but she thinks I'm using on the side, but that's all right. So, <laughs> it's still legal here. That's <laughs> well, great. Um, why don't we take a break and we'll be right back. And tonight, um, one more time, we're with Kevin White and it's, he's with the Doing Good Foundation. Welcome back, I'm Marty Otanias. This is Getting High on Anthropology. This is episode 26. Uh, tonight we have Kevin White with uh, the Doing Good Foundation. Tell us about Canna Make a Difference. What is that? Okay. Is there an upcoming event you want to tell us about? Sure, so Canna Make a Difference is our version of Colorado Gives Day. And we're just targeting the cannabis community in this effort. Um, if you're not familiar with uh, Colorado Gives Day, it's a huge, Day of Giving that's held in December, the, the biggest month of giving <laughs> for, for the entire year. Um, but it's held in December and it helps over, I think it was over 3,000 charities or near 3,000 charities this year. And they raised over $33.8 million in a day. Um, it's a 24 hour period. Pretty impressive, Definitely. pretty amazing, um, helping those 3,000 charities. But as I mentioned earlier, we have over 30,000 501c3s in the state of Colorado. So that's only affecting about 10% of the nonprofits here in our sector. And what we want to do is we want to show, we want two things. Number one, we want to connect the cannabis industry to nonprofits. And number two is we want to create a method and a, 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 a direct comparison with Colorado Gives Day for the cannabis community with a 24 hour day of giving. And our goal is $4.2 million. Now people will say, oh, that's 420. That's actually not how it came about. When I first heard the numbers for Colorado Gives Day, I thought it was 38 million. So when I add 4.2 million and you add those numbers together, 10% of that is 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 4.2 million. So it was a coincidence. So it was, it was a coincidence. I didn't realize I had the wrong number. So it's actually not 10%. But our goal is to say that in comparison to Colorado Gives Day, the cannabis community users supporters, industry people, industry companies, account for 10% of giving in the state of Colorado when you compare it with Colorado Gives Day. So that's our main goal. And we feel that that will do many things. Number one, it'll bring light to educate nonprofits on accepting cannabis money. All the money is gonna flow through the Doing Good Foundation. 10% will go to the Doing Good Foundation for the administration of the project and for their programs and services they offer the nonprofit sector. 90% will go into a fund that will be 100% of that 90% will go to, will be granted to nonprofits throughout the state of Colorado. Excellent. And th that will be administered by and determined by a committee of cannabis industry leaders, local philanthropists, government officials, and some other ancillary people within the nonprofit sector. And do you already have um, established criteria how you determine in terms of giving? Yeah, so we have some. We haven't done everything, but we know that we want to focus on nonprofits that are under a million annual budget. Um, number one, that accounts for 88% of the nonprofits here in Colorado. So it's a huge number that are, so we're not really neglecting anyone. <laughs> um, and they need the most help. Number two is they need to be in a current 501c3 status and they need to be in good standing with the IRS and good standing with the state. Um, so those are our first criteria, but it can be any category of nonprofit. 
whether it's from animals all the way to veterans, whatever category a nonprofit is in, they can submit an application to the grant process. And then what about um, range of amounts that might be disseminated for people? Yeah, that's, that's the harder one. Um, if we hit our goal of $4.2 million, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide it amongst the counties and determine based on county population, determine how much goes to individual counties. And if we don't get some from, if we don't get applicants from a particular um, county, then that money will spill over into a local county and so on and so forth. Gotcha, okay. No, it's really exciting. <laughs> what could people do if they want to learn more about it? And then what could they do to like have conversations when they're talking to bud tenders or anything that you think um, ordinary folks could do to support this um, initiative? Yeah, so our, our, our slogan is actually donate a joint. That's all we want you, whatever you pay for a joint as a consumer, just donate it on July 10th, 2017, from 12.01 a.m. until 11.59 p.m. Um, on July 10th, just donate whatever you would pay for a joint. Um, so whether that's $10, $15, whatever you would normally pay, just donate that. Um, or if you dab, because it's 710, <laughs> then you'd pay whatever you'd pay for a dab. Um, we are also asking um, for dispensaries and grow houses and things like that to whatever you would do for your giving, do it on that day. Do it through us, provide, you know, provide whatever you would normally provide in a giving campaign, and then dispense that out or dispense the information out to your, your clients and things like that so that they can participate as well. If a, if a dispensary wants to do a match, we highly recommend that as well. So if their clients are giving, then the um, person, the dispensary can do a 50% match, 100% match, 200% match. Um, that would be, we think that would be really great that they're acknowledging their clients are giving. And you have a pretty um, good um, presence on social media? So we're, we're growing it. It's, you know, we're a little bit on mass roots, so we're gonna attack that. Um, we've tried that before. That's been not as great for us, but mass roots is done a lot since they became a publicly held company. So we're, we're reaching out for that. Um, we do have some social media. It's most of our social media is give and toke. So if you go to give and toke or give toke on Instagram or <laughs> some of those, we of kind it. of all over, yeah. But everything will fold and uh, you can go to any of those websites too, giveandtoke.org or 420 gives back. They all will go to canamakeadifference.org on July 10th. Okay, for people who may be new to the culture of cannabis, what's the significance of July 10th? So July 10th is the second marijuana holiday where if you look at 710 and you flip it over, it spells oil, which is comes from the dabs and all those kinds of different things, not just the flower itself. So, so there's some symbolism. <laughs> there's behind some it. symbolism behind 710. Yeah. That's excellent. So maybe before we wrap up, um, could you tell us with the work that you're doing, especially with the um, uh, Can It Make a Difference, is there something that um, you faced an obstacle recently and how you overcame it to, to launch this and to get this started? Ooh, um, getting outside of myself. So this is something that, this is actually something I've had in my repertoire for over a year. I've wanted to do this for actually a couple years. And it's, it's hard when you're not really in the industry. I was in the nonprofit sector and then going to the cannabis industry and going, be a part of this. And they're, it's hard to get past the gatekeepers with cannabis industry, for sure. Um, so it was just meeting people in the cannabis world, number one. And so what I did was I started attending a lot of meet and greets, a lot of parties, a lot of different things within the cannabis industry and found out that there's a ton of great people that are in the cannabis industry either that they're focused on the business aspect of it or they're focused on the environmental or they're focused on the you know, the, um, healing powers of, of the plant and all the other things. And it's been great meeting all those people. So getting some people within the industry on board has been a big challenge, um, but great that they are coming on board. And the other one was just finding other people to help me with the project. So we actually, oh, I really can't say that part, but our, we do, I have a PR person, so she has been in public relations for a majority of her career. So she's, gonna, uh, she's now part of my team. And then we have another digital marketing company 
um, that has come on and will help us with the digital marketing aspect. Too. That's so, excellent. Yeah, we're excited. So in my day job, I'm a professor at UC Denver in the right. anthropology department. Students sometimes ask me about opportunities. Um, what advice would you give to a student who wants either your job or to support <laughs> your kind of organization? Like, how would they get into this? Vo and this is, I, was, I did a TEDx talk, and it was on volunteering. And anything that you want to do in a career, you can do and test in volunteering first. So get involved. I mean, we'll take volunteers, we'll take interns. They're obviously currently unpaid. Doesn't mean that they can't become paid. Um, but this is the first time we're trying this. So everything's unpaid, but we need different, we need volunteers in different things. So whether it's a student or whether it's just somebody that wants to get involved, we need people that will, um, you know, talk to dispensaries. We need people that will talk to consumers. We need people that will um, help with our social media platforms. We need graphic designers. We need, we need a lot of different things. And basically anything that you participate in, we'll need people to reach out to governments. So public affairs, things like that. Um, you know, anything that you do and things like this is amazing for us. Um, but anything that you do, you can test or add to volunteering. And you know, there's nonprofits have a lot of assets at their fingertips. Google AdWords, um, Adobe, the entire Adobe suite, we get for free or extremely low cost. But most likely, if we're a small nonprofit like we are, nobody knows how to use it. So if you want to learn that skill, come on board. I'll give you the Adobe Suite and go up, go to town. That's great. <laughs> and I really am um, in alignment with volunteering. I did a lot of volunteering when I was younger, and it helped shape my trajectory for you know my life uh, my life course. Great. So now you know, look into your crystal ball. It's May two thousand eighteen. Okay. What what change or accomplishment do you want to see with either Can It Make a Difference or the Doing Good Foundation? So, with the do, I mean, the Doing Good Foundation is is my passion, it, obviously, and that is just to impact as many nonprofits as we possibly can to get them the resources that they need to expand and advance themselves. Um, so that will just grow uh, on its own. Um, we just need the help to reach out to more nonprofits and get them to attend. All the stuff that we offer is free of charge. So we're doing a, um, a Doing Good Week, which is a week-long conference for small nonprofits. It's being hosted by the um, CU Denver um, School of Public Affairs, and it's at the, their campus, and it's 100% free for board members, volunteers, or staff of charities that are under a million annual budget, 501c3s and they can come and learn about everything. So we're gonna do one in cannabis again. We're gonna do one on, a, we'll have courses on accounting, Facebook, all the way up to volunteer management and everything you can think of in between. Um, so we are doing that. That's my goal is to make that as successful as we possibly can. 500 charities is my goal for attendance there. As far as can it make a difference, by May of 2018, our goal is to have um, at least 85% of the impact reports done on the money that we um, gave out. So we're hoping uh, 75 actually by May. So if we have 75% back on what impact, the exact impact that the cannabis money we raised during um, July 10th, we'll have all the impact studies and reports back from the charities we gave the money to. That's cool. It's really exciting what you're doing. You. And I appreciate you taking the time and being with us tonight. So we're going to end it there. Okay. So um, thank you for watching. This is Marty Otanias with Getting High on Anthropology. Tonight's guest, Kevin White with uh, canamakeadifference.org.